Over the last 51 episodes, we've taken a critical look at our country, our democracy, and our culture. From the world of fashion and hair to the politics of NASCAR and sports activism, our show asks difficult questions and we attempt to understand our changing world. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today, we celebrate our one-year anniversary with one of Disrupted's first guests. Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. joined us for that first show last October. Glaude is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Princeton University. He's also an MSNBC contributor and the 2021 recipient of the Harriet Beecher Stowe Prize. It's for his book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lesson for our own. He's back to help us reflect on the last year and the state of our democracy. Professor Glaude, welcome back to Disrupted. It is my delight to be with you. It's good to see you. It's great to see you as always, especially now because you have so much To celebrate, you are the 2021 Stowe Prize recipient. It's awarded by the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford, and it is awarded for your book, Begin Again. Talk to us about what that recognition means for you, particularly because it's coming from the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. You know, initially, I was kind of struck by the irony of it all. You know, when you read Notes of a Native Son, and you read Baldwin on Stowe, he's very critical of Uncle Tom's Cabin. He's he's very critical of the sentimentality at the heart of that abolitionist imagination, you know? And so on the one hand, I was was kind of struck by the, the irony of it, but on the other hand, I thought it was apt, you know, what the Stowe Center is trying to do, what its mission is all about, is absolutely consistent with Baldwin's witness. And so it was a kind of recognition um, that uh, made me swell with, with pride that I was actually true to, to, to Baldwin's um, life and someone recognized it. But I couldn't help but note it, to note and notice uh, the irony at the heart of it, you know. You know, I think part of the irony at the heart of that is so much of what Baldwin's work intended to do was to challenge the narrative, challenge the comfort that we have in telling these narratives because there's sort of an ease in how those stories are accepted. And to have a book like yours be able to put that in context is key. This show, Disrupted, is now officially one year old and you were a guest on our very first show. So that's why we're so excited to have you back. It was also one of the most memorable interviews that we did in that first season. And so we wanted to have you come back and reflect because I think where we were a year ago or where we thought we were a year ago may be quite different from what we see today. We were heading into a contentious presidential election. It was pre that January 6th insurrection, which ironically in your interview, you pointed to as a possibility that when you are challenging people's identity that is so tied into destruction, there will be this backlash. But it also was in a moment where, you know, people were clamoring to respond to the moment of George Floyd and others. There were book clubs. Everyone wanted to be branded as anti-racist. And your interview a year ago really challenged all of us to take a step back. When you think about this past year and all that we've been enduring, what is it that sticks out to you as surprising, but also troubling? Uh, What's troubling is is somewhat surprising too, you know, how quick, how quickly our attention turned, right? The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act languishes in Congress. Um, the debate around critical race theory, right? The, the, the assault on telling the truth about who we are, you know, the fear of not only being displaced demographically, but the fear of being displaced historiographically, right? Evidencing itself in this front that has been open 
around how do we tell the story of America, right? We saw that in the debates between the 1619 Project and whatever the hell 1776 is, right? But this, we saw in real time the reassertion of the lie, right? To, 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 to really arrest our imaginations, how people, um, you know, thought that the election of Joe Biden would somehow signal that we had, we had left behind the ugliness, right? And what it has revealed more than, more than anything is that Trump was just the tip of the iceberg, right? And so I think what's troubling is that we are on a mo in a moment where uh, American democracy stands on a knife's edge, that there's no guarantee that this experiment will survive this. And I'm not being hyperbolic there. You know, um, in all of the other moments of conflict, America was young. You think about coming out of the Civil War and, and post reconstruction and, uh, you know, the, the, the horrors of the lost cause and, and whatnot. You know, young, we made the bad choice and still the nation, you know, coming out of World War II. Uh, America brings the globe back online with this account, young, even in the context of the mid 20th century. But now things don't feel so vibrant, right? The world is not coming out of the devastation of World War II. Uh, the, dark, the darker peoples of the planet are not emerging from, from colonial, the yoke of colonialization, colonialism, as it were. Uh, America is, is not singular. And if it feels as if we make the wrong choice this time, uh, which there are dark forces cleaving to, you know, to to old visions, as it were. There's a real chance we might not survive this as a democracy. You know, that's the troubling feature. One of the requirements to survive trouble is to have leadership to navigate. And I'm intentional about saying leadership not as a leader or a singular force, but a collective commitment to leadership that is able to have that long-term vision with those immediate choices. And in the country right now, you mentioned the Biden administration or the, the misgivings that people had that this singular election outcome would be enough. What do you think the U.S. needs right now in terms of leadership from the Biden administration, but also leadership at the everyday grassroots level, which you and I know can often have a much greater impact on securing and protecting freedom? At the national level, I think we need a leadership with the vision to finally break loose from the stranglehold of Reaganism, right? The, the age of Reagan has collapsed. Its fundamental pillars have revealed themselves to be bankrupt. Right? This idea that government by definition is bad, that it only has the function of ensuring the efficiency of the economy and protecting you know, uh, national defense. Well, COVID has revealed that's not true, right? The idea that tax, you know, tax cuts for the wealthy will generate uh, uh, you know, uh, benefit for the, the public broadly, that has proven itself to be not true. The idea that you can incarcerate Right, folk, that calls for law and order, that you can build a carceral state and maintain a robust conception of the public good by appealing to people's fears, and that becomes the basis of governance, that has revealed itself as bankrupt. So the fundamental pillars of Reaganism, which we might describe as neoliberalism, right, have, have left white people in a precarious state. And so part of what the collapse of aid, the age of Reagan entails, at least for me, is that the Democratic Party that came into existence to respond to it has to collapse. See, people don't understand that formula. Let me say that in a different way. That the third way that came out of the De Democratic Leadership Council, that third way that we can locate with Gary Hart and, 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 and Dick Gephardt and, you know, and, and Al Gore and, and Bill Clinton, and we can just, and even Joe Biden was a part of this, right? That that particular response to Reaganism entailed a capitulation to Reagan's basic principles. And so what we're hearing, at least I'm hearing in this moment, even as we see the infrastructure bill, the Build Back Better plan, it's 
its central elements still are committed to the basic frame of Reaganism. It's trying to figure out how to take portions of FDR's uh, uh, agenda and graft it onto the basic assumptions of Reaganism. That's not going to work. So at, at, the, at the national level, I want us to finally put the last nail in the coffin of the ideology of Reaganism. That's the first. At the local level, we're going to have to uh, continue to fight uh, and organize to change the conception of, of, of law and order to, social, to safety and security. We're gonna have to really fight uh, to, to, to resist uh, the reassertion of, of, of policing as a way of, of addressing crime in some ways, right? We gotta, we gotta really dismantle the carceral state from the bottom up. We have to, and that's gonna involve, I think, I'm, gonna, I'm talking too much here. It's gonna involve putting pressure to bear on lo local municipalities to imagine, imagining their budgetary priorities differently. So when we say defund the police, they think we're just talking about just, you know, zero out the budget of police departments. That's not what folk is saying. Just like that's not what, you know, they defund public education, but they don't, you know, but what we're talking about is budget your priorities, budget your values, right? And if you don't believe in carcerality as an answer to social ills, then you're gonna invest in different, in different spaces. So we know mayors in Buffalo, right? We know folk around the country are trying to bring pressure to bear at the local level in order for that, those, those values to be evident in how re resources are allocated. So on the national level, let's break the back of age of, of Reaganism. At the local level, let's continue to bring pressure to bear on municipalities to budget in such a way that reflects a different way of our being together. Um, and that's, that's, that, that's a bit abstract, but I think we can, I think that makes sense to me at least. <laughs> well, let's move from the abstract to the practical because there will be people who will listen to this conversation and completely agree with you to say, yes, that culture of Reaganism has not served us well. And by the us, I mean collectively. But then there will be people who will say, but how do we do that? When, when we talk about municipalities and the state level, we are seeing an all out attack and assault to dismantle voting rights. That, that most basic premise that it used to be people could at least agree upon this is what is a cornerstone of democracy. And we are seeing states assert over and over and be allowed to do so by the Supreme Court that actually we don't want people to vote. So if voting is under attack, if people are feeling this fatigue of movement fatigue, then how do we actually implement this to exert pressure in a way that is not temporary? That once the cameras have gone on, once the service honoring people like Congressman John Lewis has ended, that there is actually something substantive to do the things that you say we need to do. Well, what we do know, and, I, and let me just say up front, I don't have all the answers. I'm trying to figure this out like everyone else, trying to think how we move forward. What I do know is the, when I look to the examples of our history, you know, SNCC was, they weren't in the South with thousands of people. They were moving and organizing two by two, three by three, four, you know, trying in so many ways. So when the cameras, you know, left after the massive spectacle of the marches and whatnot, let's use Selma as an example. What, what were they doing? They were organizing in Lowndes County. Right. So part of what we have to do is to understand local organizations doing this hard work and trying to figure out how to bring pressure to bear right on on elected officials, how to organize communities to elect the people we want. See, this is the key, I think, at least in terms of the national debate around voting. And you tell me if I'm wrong, because, you know, you study this stuff for a living uh, and you teach it for a living. Um, I think the Democrats are dragging their feet because they know the For the People Act might jeopardize their seats. Because when you look at the particulars of the bill, it empowers a certain kind of candidate, right? That didn't, that didn't need the authorization of the, of, of, of the local uh, political authorities in the party. They, they didn't need, uh, uh, the, you won't need all this money. You know how Connecticut changed its rules. 
right? And then what happened once you change which to public financing, who can run and who might win? So democratic politicians have a vested interest in keeping the status quo, even though they want us all to vote, you see, quote unquote. So I think part of what we have to do at the local level is to understand that organizing from neighborhood to neighborhood, from individual to individual around particular issues, so that we can elect the people we want who can then move the needle. And that may involve challenging democratic politicians uh, who are in some ways slow walking this thing. That's Eddie Glaude Jr., professor and chair of African-American studies at Princeton University. Coming up, Glaude talks about how he remains hopeful during this difficult time and why it's so important for communities to be politically engaged. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This episode marks one year of our show, and we've brought you conversations about disruptors in our communities. We've explored the feminist movement and the history of the fight for beach access in Connecticut. Today, we bring back our very first guest, Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. Glaude is a distinguished professor at Princeton University and author of Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lesson for our own. When we spoke with him back in 2020, it was on the cusp of a presidential election. It was before the January 6th insurrection and even before debates about vaccines and variants. We asked Claude to tell us how he remains hopeful during such a difficult time in American history. Well, we should be frustrated, obviously. It seems to me, but you know, I, I, my one of my favorite lines comes out, you know, come comes out of uh, Du Bois's uh, of the passing of the firstborn, a hope not hopeless but unhopeful. You know, where do we find hope? It's a blue soaked hope, right? We're gonna have to we're gonna have to figure out how to push this boulder up the hill again, you know, or Talib Kweli's line of around the beautiful struggle, right? That the struggle itself is what constitutes. Uh, the ground for hope, because hope is a verb, right? It's not a state, uh, you know, of being. It's actually an action in the world, you see. So, look, it seems to me we're in this moment where either we shift the center of gravity of our political imaginations, or we will find ourselves stuck on this hamster wheel. Now, what, is the, what does it mean to shift the center of gravity of our political imaginations at one level? It means not only kind of dismantling the age of Reagan, it means, and I keep harping on this because the Democrats are, because it's a two party system and because one party has been overrun by illiberalism and is on the road to fascism, the Democratic party bears the burden here of, of really being the front line outside of everyday ordinary people's work right, the front line of salvaging of American democracy. What the Democratic Party has to do is to finally stop acting like a forlorn, a scorned lover. What do I mean by that? They've been trying their damnedest since the Reagan Democrat came onto, onto the scene to get the Reagan Democrat to love them. The center of the Democrats' party, the Democratic Party's political imagination, the center of the imagination of, of the fourth estate, the center of the imagination of the Republican Party is a white, heterosexual, working class male. And the demographic shifts of the country are changing the nature of our politics, changing the nature of of who walks around and inhabits this place. But our politics is driven, remain driven by that figure and and the stereotypes and assumptions around that figure. Unless we de-center the quote unquote working class, heterosexual white male from our political imaginations, we will continue 
to do exactly what we're doing. Because right now the Democrats are running afraid, whether it's coming out of the mouth of Joe Biden or under the, out of the mouth of Jim Clyburn. Both of them still have at the center of their imaginations that particular political figure, that character, that voter. And we have to displace that if we're going to imagine ourselves anew. Are there people that you would say are a part of this process or part of this system who actually are trying to move us in that direction? Because I, I think that power of imagination, the power of possibility, the power of not being wedded to the status quo, because as you said, it benefits a lot of people, even if their identity is not shared, that becomes very elusive and seductive. So who do you feel like is really moving us toward that direction? You know, I love what Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, what they're doing, and particularly in West Virginia, right? When you hear uh, uh, low wealth white women challenging Joe Manchin, saying, look, we, we have to engage in effect, um, you know, basically throwing what we, we would call in Jamaica a partner, right? In order to gather resources just to buy, you know, you know, products for our cycles, you know, to, to foreground a kind of coalition that cuts across the racial divides and to articulate the relationship between voting rights legislation and $15 minimum wage and Medicare for all, to understand these issues as not just simply black and white issues, but really issues that cut to the heart of our self-conception. That's, that's really powerful. Or I think about what AOC has done or what Jamal Bauman is, as Bowman is doing, right? The so-called squad at the, at the national level, right? Trying really to kind of get us to think about um, our politics differently. So, you know, we're talking about taxing, you know, uh, at 70, I mean, you think about the way in which people are talking about taxing the rich just five years ago, that was unimaginable, right? But, but you know what, at the same time that I hear that language, I hear, you know, the talking points of, of the Biden administration about we must lift up the middle class. Damn it, talk about the poor. Talk about the low well, right? And so I hear forces afoot, but they're actually running up against um, a, you know, a consultancy class, a political class who are in some ways holding on to the basic assumptions of an ideology for the last 40 years that has not only destroyed the country, but is damn near destroying the planet. And I think about the power of those coalitions, of the coming together and the intentional cultivating of that shared struggle. I can't help but think about the Reverend Jesse Jackson in this dynamic. And especially now, as he has been facing some health challenges, it has also been this recognition of the multi-generational, intergenerational notion of freedom and the fight for freedom and the need to not just remember and honor our elders who have paved the way, but to be willing to let some of our own hubris go to actually be guided by that. When you think about this next generation of leaders and freedom fighters and the next iterations of this struggle, because as you said, it, it will not go away. What are the lessons that you think we should be taking from the experiences of a Jesse Jackson who, when you mentioned the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, remembering what it, it felt like, you know, I was, it was young in my political awareness then, but what it felt like to see this black man running for office and having someone who is supposed to be in the same party not even shake his hand because they wanted that visual reminder that yes, this person may be in the party, but we want to cater to this mythical voter and we will do it at the expense of the basic civility that we claim is needed. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's so much, there's so much in that question. Because, you know, when I think about, you know, just Reverend Jackson's Rainbow Coalition uh, when you think about that 84 run, particularly more than the 88 run, and what he was able to do and how he opened up the Democratic Party in such a way that made Barack Obama's uh, candidacy viable, right? How he changed uh, uh, the electoral landscape in the South in interesting sorts of ways. But I also think about the pitfalls of that model of leadership. 
Right? What does it mean to be preacher centered as opposed to pew centered? Right? What does it mean to think about Miss Ella Baker's model as, as a counterexample? So one of the lessons I want uh, young folk to learn, right? It's not about who's at the front of the line. It's about the, the, the work that is being done to cultivate the capacities of everyday ordinary people to be the leaders they are looking for, to echo Ms. Baker, right? One of the beautiful things I love about Reverend Barber is that he has these gatherings and he speaks, he's in that preacherly tradition, but he steps back and he puts forward everyday ordinary people, folk who, who aren't, um, who won't fit the bill of a certain kind of respectability, you know? He puts them forward in certain ways. But, but I think the lesson to learn is that we don't want to kind of outsource, right, our well-being to particular organizations or particular leaders who are engaged in a certain kind of representative politics where they kind of broker on behalf of Black folk with the powers that be. We want to engage in a certain kind of politics that once we pass from the scene, once our time is over, that we've created the conditions under which everybody can do the work on their own, right? So you think about the, the temptation that, was, that these young folk faced with Black Lives Matter, the quickness of absorption. I mean, it took, how long did it take SNCC to implode, to then become leaders of local governments, and to find themselves, right, kind of compromised or potentially compromised by the monies of big government and corporate, it took at least a decade and a half for that to happen among some of them, right? Think about the quickness of the absorption of Black Lives Matter leaders. After the break, we continue our conversation with Princeton professor Eddie Glaude Jr., he will reflect on the life of James Baldwin and how leaving America can sometimes be the best way to better understand America. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today on the one year anniversary of our show, we're speaking with one of our first guests, Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. He's professor and chair of African-American studies at Princeton University and author of Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lesson for our own. On its first visit to the show, Glaude talked about his connection to novelist and activist James Baldwin, and he frequently reflects on Baldwin's writings via social media. Last month, he tweeted this quote from James Baldwin. The question of my identity had never before been so crucially allied with my reality, the doom of the moral choice. I asked Glaude what that passage means to him and how he connects this to the way he thinks about the world today. These aren't abstract questions that have every, only to do with, you know, issues of law and, and power and, and the like. Of course they are. Of course they, you know, we don't want to be naive. Of course it, they, they involve um, who is elected, how are resources distributed. But at a certain level of consideration, this is really about what kind of human being you're going to be that these political choices are actually reflective of your moral sense, of your moral sense, your moral center. So I'm, I think it's important for us not to lose sight of, of, of the moral and ethical question at the heart of these political choices, because at the heart of it all is what kind of human being are you? What kind, of, what kind of country is this going to be? Are you going to be complicit in evil? And you know, for some people, oh, that's just moral drivel that doesn't, what we really are concerned about is just raw power. No, 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 no. I'm not just concerned about raw power. I'm concerned about what I'm gonna do between these two significant breaths. Because we only have two significant breaths, the first one and the last one. And the question is what we're gonna do in between them. And so when, if, if, if I'm trying to figure out what kind of person 
I'm going to be in a world shot through with all sorts of ugliness. This moment in which we find ourselves, who are you going to identify with? Are you going to identify with the least of these? Will your selfishness overrun everything? Are you going to, are you going to wallow in ugliness? Are you going to side with evil? Are you content with yourself as you are? Oh my God, no. So to me, I was reading that. It's in No Name. It came out of No Name in the Street in 1972. And he's writing this as the country's turning his back on black folk. Bobby Hutton and Angela, Bobby's dead. And Malcolm's dead. And Mick is dead. It's like, oh, the choices we make now. Mm. The choices we make now. Dot, dot, dot. One of the choices that Baldwin made was to move to Europe and make that his second home. And so when you think about all of the things that continue to disturb us, but also continue to challenge us, I have to ask you, do you think the idea of America, the idea of the United States is redeemable? Or do you think we're at a moment where more people may pursue the path that Baldwin and others pursued of saying, this is not the place for me even if I continue to care about it. The idea of America as a white nation is not redeemable. There's nothing redeemable about it, period. And I don't, I like to think more of America, not as an idea, but as an argument, right? And it's an argument that I don't want to see. But if you believe that America is a white nation in the vein of old Europe, that idea has no merit whatsoever. It's irredeemable, but it doesn't mean that you who might hold it, it doesn't mean that you are irredeemable, right? So my thinking is that Baldwin as a writer who had to deal with unimaginable pressures and had to deal with fame and celebrity, oh Lord, I can only tell you stories about what that means, right? He needed the distance so he could say something about the place. He needed, um, uh, the quiet so that he could he could be a poet in Emerson's sense of the word. He never, I don't ever think he was, he thought of himself as an exile. I don't ever think of him as giving up on, on, on America, on the argument. Um, it's just by the time, you know, Reagan comes into office, people don't want to hear him no more. Black people don't want to hear, him, you know. We're too busy preoccupied with Cosby's, with Cosby's sweaters at the time. See, I, I don't care. You see, <laughs> you see, I don't care what I, you know, I'm just telling the truth. You know, I, I'm thinking that that was the big debate, right? The sweater and how realistic is this representation? At the end of the day, folks were dying because they didn't have access to the things that they needed to live the most basic part of life. What does the future look like? for scholars of color, particularly black scholars, who are addressing the kind of issues that you raise and face that kind of hostility all the time? It's uncertain. You know, people better get it, they better not get it twisted. The, the winds are going to change. They're gonna shift. And there's, there, you know, folks aren't gonna be as interested in the work that we do. Um, they're, you know, I, I've been in the academy long enough to know what it's like to be, right, in a corner in Dickinson Hall, right, and what it means to have, you know, a full floor of Morrison, in Morrison Hall at Princeton, you know. Um, so I don't know what the future holds. It's uncertain. It's just not guaranteed. The only thing I know is that we have to control what we can control. So you have to exhibit the discipline to get your work done. You can't, you can't, you can't fall privy to the golden apples, as as the boys put it, you know, in the on the wings of Atalanta, you know, but right? the lure of celebrity of of great, you got to get your work done, and you get your work done uh, in a context that doesn't guarantee you security, but it at least gives you the space to say what you want to say that's in your heart, so. Um, Dr. West, my close partner, 
my friend, my mentor, I love him to life, uh, has always modeled for me, what does it, how can I put it? He has modeled for me how to exist in these spaces on your own terms. And that's what we have to aspire to, right? And we can control that. We can't control them, but we can control how we plant our feet, how we walk among in these spaces. But the precondition is getting your work done. <laughs> and defining what the work is for you and for your terms, because I think it is easy to be distracted and to be um, lured into thinking that the work is something, you know, what, what is the phrase that the the function of racism, Toni Morrison says, is to distract you from the work. And then you find yourself looking back, feeling broken and thinking, wait a minute, how did I veer off course? This show is called Disrupted. We started the show a year ago in a moment of major disruptions for all Americans, but for particularly for Black folks who were saying, this isn't new for us. The name COVID-19 may be new. The, the name racial injustice may be new for others. But this experience of tremendous vulnerability is not new. Thinking about the path forward, thinking about the history that has brought us to this place, I want to end by asking you what you think we should be focusing on in order to create that better future that can be possible. Oh, God, so much. It's so much. We have to shift the center of gravity of our political imaginations. We have to focus on a way of being together that reflects um, a different set of values where material things aren't moving us about, but where there's a basic commitment that we that underlies the public good. Let me say that more concretely. These folk have shredded any semblance of a social contract. It doesn't exist. It's not just the disappearance of a social safety net. It's the disappearance of a social safe, a social contract. That's all we have right now are, are selfish people in pursuit of their own interests. And so we need to say um, every American, no matter your zip code, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your ability, your gender, you, we're going to give you the best education in the world. If you're sick, don't worry about it. We got you. We're going to shift we're gonna shift from carcerality to safety and security. And we're gonna have a broader conversation about what safety looks like so that people can dream new dreams. We gotta reset the table, right? And underneath it all, we're gonna to have to finally commit ourselves to being a multiracial democracy. But I say all of that as, as in aspirational terms because I'm from a blues people. And as my great grandmama used to tell me, don't you get focused on these folks. You know they're not gonna change. You just keep, you just keep putting, you just keep waking up in the morning and keep fighting for good. So I got my dreams, but I understand the reality of the world in which we inhabit. But we're gonna keep dreaming though, in spite of it all. Eddie Claude Jr. is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Princeton University. He's author most recently of Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lesson for our own professor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for the gift of Disrupted. My God, thank you. Disrupted is produced by James Scopel Wolf, Shekinah Collier, and Katie Talarski. And I want to give a very special shout out to everyone who made this first year possible. Thank you to Anna Elizabeth, Daniela Luna, Meg Fitzgerald, Vanessa Delatore, Tim Rasmussen, and of course, to my village. Finally, I want to thank all of you for being part of this journey. We're grateful to every person who's listened to our show, to every guest on the show, and those of you who join us on radio and via podcasts. And if you haven't yet subscribed, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear your show ideas and your feedback. You can email us at disrupted at ctpublic.org. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Thanks for listening.